organized by members of Sea Watch. Sea Watch is a nonprofit initiative that's dedicated to the civilian rescue um, of refugees at sea. Um, and they're going to be talking to us about a new tech that's going to be implemented or that is implemented at the European border and how that technology is being used not for, for good purposes, but rather uh, being used against human rights. So please give a big round of applause to Niska and Nick. Yeah, uh, hello, good evening, and thanks for coming. Um, yeah, uh, like I said, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, Frontex, uh, Eurozor, and the European border surveillance system. Uh, I'm Nick, I work with Sea-Watch since 2016. Um, I help out with the IT there, and actually I wanted to do the talk with Alina, who cannot be here today, so Nisko was so kind and helped out, so. Yeah, hi. I'm Neska and I've been working for Sea Watch um, airborne operations for about a year and a half and I'll um, give some insight into what ex we experience there with our aircraft uh, day in and day out flying next to Frontex airplanes. So, uh, we will start with a short video, uh, which was partly the reason why uh, yeah, I started preparing this talk. Um, I found it like surfing on YouTube um, and it's was given in 2015 during a developers conference of ESRI. ESRI produces uh, geo-information software um, for governments, for private companies, etc. And uh, Pieter Malinowski, the head of Eurosur, of the European Border Surveillance System, uh, yeah, talked there to the developers to yeah, kind of recruit them. And when I saw that, uh, I, I thought, like, yeah, people have to see this. You will see now why. It's really important to say, like, we cut at the beginning. If you see like, European Union flag, you fully. might think, my gosh, there is another bureaucrat today. He's going to talk about, you know, minimum size of bananas which can be sold in EU. But we will be talking about more important things today than bananas. We will be talking about internal security. We will be talking about challenges which we are facing today as Europe and how my agency, Frontex, uh, helps member states of the European Union to tackle those challenges and threats. So one of our primary political goal is to make sure that we can support member states with a state-of-the-art technology to limit the number of deaf bodies on the high seas, including kids like that. But there is also a dark side of border management. We are talking about those guys. They are trying more and more to hide in the groups of illegal migrants and reach uh, European Union the newest threat, Ebola virus. You will see later in my presentation that uh, migrants trying to reach Europe on small boats, that's a perfect, perfect environment. If there is a one person on board infected with Ebola, entire boat can be infected. And you can imagine what can happen if that boat will land on one of our shores in Italy or Greece. So those are, those are three main areas where Frontex is trying to support member states. We do not do that ourselves as agency. We provide capabilities to member states. And member states can use those capabilities to do the proper job. And most of those capabilities are smart technology, smart assets, uh, intelligence pictures, risk analysis, one of the biggest part of our job, risk analysis. One of the main framework, legal framework that we are using currently to do our job, meaning to save human lives, to uh, limit cross-border crime, uh, and to track as much as possible all those terrorists trying to get into European Union, we use a new legal framework and te technical framework called Eurosur, which is a European border surveillance system. And this framework is and will be the main tool for Europe to improve situational awareness, to increase reaction capability at the external borders for three main goals. Save as many people as possible, uh, find out all criminals and terrorists trying to reach European Union borders, And I said all that safely in lives, yes, that's the most important one. So, 
we decided a couple of years ago to invest uh, in GIS capabilities. Today we, we call it Frontex Core GIS. The main engine of uh, Frontex Core GIS is based, of course, on your products. So we have diverse uh, data sources, and to be honest, we are not limited in data sources. Basically, on a daily basis, we are looking for new data sources from different providers. Uh, there is no limit there. I would say sky is the limit. We are, our, our platform is ready to support all data formats or data sources that are available there. So it's uh, just a matter of finding them. So that's our main platform. Of course, we have here a basic GIS capabilities, like we can uh, decide which one, which base map we want to use. I will not show you that because probably that's the basic stuff for you. Yes. But one of the requirements I set for us was to develop a system that operator needs only finger, nothing else. So we decided to, to, to build in a uh, couple of different frameworks, technological frameworks, to achieve that goal. Yes? So right now, what I will do, and usually what our users do with fingers on touch screens or tablets, they just drag and drop different data sets on the screen. So we have, for instance, a full picture about all commercial and fishing vessels right now on OpenSea. We are using diverse group of reporting systems, AIS, satellite AIS, uh, LRIT, long range identification and traffic, VMS for fishing vessels, even positioning on so on so on of some uh, pleasure boats, yes? So everything what has transponder on it, we can see it here. And I will tell you in two minutes why it's so important for us and for our operators. Another thing what we try to do, we try to provide to our users detailed models of the weather on the sea. So basically, our officer can zoom in in the area where he is interested or she is interested. And you see right now, today at 6 o'clock, the size of waves here in this area is 2 meters. But officer can play and see how the situation will change during the next hours. We, we also provide a simulation where the boat can end up. We take into account, we have models which are using currents, uh, temperature of the sea, everything, to predict where a certain size of the boat with certain engine capabilities can be. And keep in mind, I present you today only a part related to situational awareness, situational picture, real to near time. Uh, that's, let's say, 40% of our job. 60% is risk analysis, where our colleagues from risk analysis unit are using extensively GIS platform, SQGIS platform, to predict how the situation will change in the future, uh, what are the new trends, uh, and visualize that. They, they, they try to do a visualization for decision-making uh, folks, basically to let them see in easy to understand way how the situation will change. And it's all on, on the maps, on web maps, on portals, uh, and I think that is a successful example how this GIS can support uh, uh, first, that we can feel a little safer here, and secondly, that we can save some human beings. And I would like to thank you guys from S3, most of you probably, because you can say yes, because of your job, you save those people. Those faces of those kids, you know, probably, uh, maybe not those, because uh, I don't, uh, fortunately, can present you the real pictures of kids we save because of some legal aspects. But you can say yes, you contributed to, the, to, to this process, yes. So that's a, that's a big thank you from us, from our government to you. Thank you. So, yeah, sorry that we showed such a long video. We, we already cut it at, like as, as much as we could because we didn't want to show like such a long blob. But uh, yeah, we, we, we thought like, yeah, it's like really interesting to show this mindset and to show what they, yeah, like, yeah, how they sell what they are doing, which is, yeah, we can see that it's not the case as they describe it there. So um, now we'll shortly talk about like, the Schengen area, why Frontex um, is actually, yeah, why Frontex says it's needed. Um, so, yeah, the short history, like in 1885, uh, uh, the European Union, or like countries within the European Union wanted to do this borderless area, uh, which in 1995 actually became like the borderless area. And from there on, Frontex actually wasn't uh, in there. It started in 2006 with the Schengen Borders Code. And um, there, like, they organized that the countries are required to, to 
there they basically organize like those checks, how, are, how they are formalized, how strict they have to be, um, etc. And um, then also with that, uh, Frontex was uh, founded, uh, by then only called Frontex, now they just changed the name to European Border and Coast Guard Agency. Um, they, what they basically do is uh, they provide the, or they organize the border controls uh, within the European Union or within the Schengen area um, for uh, not only for its citizens but also for third party citizens and they are there to harmonize the border controls. That means like uh, creating standards and um, yeah, yeah, harmonizing the, the border controls in a way that, that they're like alike in, uh, within all the countries. Um, and they facilitate the cooperation uh, between the different uh, national polices and give them tools, develop tools for them and train them in using them. What kind of tools uh, I will go into later. And uh, they do a risk analysis, uh, which is then also part of, of Eurostore. Um, when we look at the budget of Frontex, um, we see a slight increase, um, especially uh, in the next years. Um, probably because of the um, situation in Europe right now. Um, yeah, like the, the idea is, is like not to um, help out actually where it's needed, but instead like build up this Fortress Europe with yeah quite a, quite a lot of money. Um, then, in 2013, uh, Frontex wasn't enough. Um, they they started building up the European Border Surveillance System, which is um, they, they call it the technical framework, which is like yeah a little bit undefined. And what's really important, the budget of, of that, uh, which was like 300 million, um, is not equal to the Frontex budget. That, that means like it was like added even like to this whole, whole lot of money. Um, it's there um, to generate like a situation picture within Europe, like this, this whole map thingy you just saw. And um, what's also really relevant, also like a pre-frontier um, situation analysis, which means like they're not only looking at the direct borders, um, they also look into the, the pre-border areas. That means within Africa, the, the sub saharan Africa, are people starting moving there and might that be a problem for Europe? Um, they want to use drones, satellites, underwater drones, like on land drones, everything. Like it's, yeah, like they, they really watch too much James Bond movies. And um, what's really important, like they, they, they sell all of this Arosu thing, like they want to save human lives. You, you also just saw, saw this dude talking about how important like these children are to him. But when you look at what they are actually doing, it's like the, the exact opposite. It's all about building up the Fortress Europe. So, um, and what's also really important, this, uh, this saving human lives aspect was only added after like, a lot of pressure of the opposition in the European Parliament and after 300 people died in front of Lampedusa one week before all of this was um, yeah, established. So, and you see it again like, like a quote from the European Commission after um, yeah, bringing it into program. Like it's, it's all about saving human lives and for sure border cross traffic, but yeah, actually it's just saving lives. So, and here, um, now we go through some of the slides um, that, that he just uh, presented. So um, here you can see, I hope it's, it's quite small. So, so there you see like, like how they, um, so they have like this weather data, they have this, um, this um, AIS data, that, that means the ship's positions and the, the satellite pictures, etc. And uh, they want to like push it into this combined service so that like every border guard can just yeah do it with a web service with one finger, uh, which is like a slight problem when when you think about like how much data is aggregated in there and um, what decisions might be taken because of the data which is aggregated there. So um, and, and and there you see like how how they want to do it. So they have the the Frontex vessels, they have the um, normal merchant vessels, they have um, the, the European uh, military missions, and all of that goes then together into this yeah, GIS system and in the Eurosur network uh, where, where the data can be accessed. Uh, what's really important for us, uh, for us like um, th this data is from 2014, so they, they already started having um, their complete data sources about everything what's actually happening in, uh, happening in the Mediterranean Sea. That means um, the AIS data, which is yeah, the position data of every uh, commercial ship, which would be really, really interesting for us. Uh, Neke will tell you later why. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's just closed within like this, this black box Frontex. When he talks about satellite um, detection services, what's, what's really important to, to know there, um, especially when we think about like, do they see what's happening there? Do they see how people die? Um, the radar satellites do not, cannot provide like a 24-7 uh, capability to monitor 
um, the Mediterranean Sea because they're not geostationary. That means like they're not above one point of the Earth all the time. Instead, they, they move around all the time. That means um, they, they cannot have like, like a live picture of the Mediterranean Sea. Instead, like this, this satellite is passing by every once in a while. And there you can like see basically what, what, what the time frames are. So like, um, yeah, every day um, between, like on, on a different time that they're able to, to see this area. So um, they don't have this 24-7 this surveillance, that, which is why they want to use drones. And especially like this autonomous drones, which can fly all the time and swarm, blah, blah, blah. I, I will come to that later. Um, to, to have this like real time, all the time surveillance of, of, a, of an area, which if it works, we will see, but yeah. So, and here you can see basically how they do the autom automatized analysis. Um, so th there, there you can see, um, wh when you see a green triangle, it means that um, there's already a data point from the AS system. So from, from this official system where they, where they send their location points. What they also see, is that they're like a lot of tiny boats which don't send the signal. So um, they, they match this and every um, ship which is like not matching the signal is something which might be suspicious. And especially like if then the ship goes straight north towards Lampedusa, et cetera, um, it might be something where, where they might could investigate. So which is really interesting when we look at the case that we'll not need to talk about because if this is the case, if the stuff is working, they can see a lot of stuff which where they either should inform um, yeah, the, the European authorities or at least um, the, the, the Libyan authorities. So what we can see there, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not talking like the Libyan authorities in the case that those boats are sinking. So, um, and we don't know how, how much this is happening. Um, and it's, um, but we, we know that uh, the Libyan Coast Guard posted this picture. So, um, which, like, we, we never get this kind of information. We never get any information if they know about of any boats and if they know about boats uh, where they are. Um, but the Libyan Coast Guard posted this picture on the, on the Facebook site. And um, it's obviously a picture taken out of, of a surveillance airplane, uh, a drone or, or something like this, showing them rescuing, rescuing a boat. So th there we have, like, the really big question, like, why do they have this data and we don't? So, and now Niska is going to talk about, yeah, like one case which is like really uh, interesting in this context. So. Um, yeah, as Nick said, um, this information would be immensely uh, important for our work as well. Um, all we basically have is our aircraft and the ships that are out there of the NGOs. Um, we have come to a point uh, with European politics that we are not even informed about distress cases anymore by the um, Rescue Coordination Center, uh, even if we are the closest vessel um, in the area, for example. We, we are not informed because obviously um, we're not supposed to rescue these people to Europe. So. Um, with our aircraft, um, as we can fly most of the time, even when the ships have been um, yeah, stuck in port uh, because of European politics, um, we witnessed a lot of cases over this year um, where we know that Frontex and other um, European authorities knew about boats in distress. Um, and where they chose not to do anything or where they um, potentially informed um, the so-called Libyan Coast Guard and the, they did not rescue in the end. So that boats were left at sea um, up to several weeks. Um, the most prominent case of this year was a boat, um, a small rubber boat that you see in the picture as well, with 15 people on board. It started on the 1st of... Um, August in Zawiya in western um, Libya and it was at sea for 11 days before it was finally um, spotted and reported. Um, these were 11 days of really, really good weather um, in which um, we know of several cases um, that had uh, involvement of Frontex and involvement of um, other European aircraft. And still, this case was not reported. They pretend that they only knew of this case uh, on this 11th day. And on that day, there was one survivor still on board. And the other 14 had died. Um, we, from, from what we witnessed over these um, days, um, we can pretty much assume that they 
knew of this case before but chose not to rescue. Um, this was another case, this was in June of this year. Um, it was um, a boat of people who had called Alarm Phone, um, an organization that provides um, a number, a phone number with which, to which people can um, make a call from satellite phones if they are on the move. And um, from Alarm Phone, we knew that this boat had been at sea for three days. Um, by the time that uh, our aircraft spotted this boat, um, this was already um, the, the third day then, and they had run out of fuel. They were already in the Maltese search and rescue area. Um, and the interesting part is that um, the armed forces of Malta were already informed, and Frontex aircraft was on scene. Um, and what usually happens is that they try to avoid any kind of communication that we can overhear, because obviously they don't want us to, to listen to that, to what they're doing and what they know. Um, in this case, however, um, the operator on the Frontex aircraft was not so uh, cautious and uh, said on the radio, on an open channel, um, that they had been monitoring them for hours. That was um, the, the quote. Um, what happened then was that we informed, obviously, about this distress case and um, knew that Armed Forces Malta already knew about it. They were on scene, but they chose not to rescue. Um, we came back to this case about six hours later after having patrolled the area furthermore, and they had still not rescued these people. And at that point, um, we then basically had to threaten them that we were going to take them to court with the um, proof, with the video evidence and the audio recordings that we had, which is, um, has become, unfortunately, one of our main tasks to uh, record everything that we witness to then yeah, be able to threaten them, but also potentially um, assist in like court cases that might take these people in some future um, and bring, bring that kind of behavior to justice. Um, only after this threat did they start to rescue. Um, so this was the vessel uh, of the Maltese um, just standing by instead of rescuing. And um, yeah, for hours they were left next to them. Um, we have a lot of these cases. Um, unfortunately, in, in many situations, um, we don't have um, actual evidence because we can't be on scene with our aircraft forever. We have an endurance of like six hours, so um, we can't be there 24 seven to um, yeah, collect all this evidence and the recordings that we would need to prove more of these cases. But I think, um, yeah, they're quite, um, explicit and you get an idea of what's happening down there on a, on a daily basis, basically. Um, yeah, so what we talked about so far, like with, with Eurostore, um, are programs uh, which are like already running at the moment, or which, which they're like building up at the moment, like to, to get it running, like if it's running, I actually have no idea. Um, but uh, what's really, really interesting uh, when we look into the future is like uh, programs which are like under the hood of Horizon 2020. Um, and that's the European framework uh, for research and in innovation. That means like um, it's um, a program where they're like giving budget for uh, scientific research in areas that are interesting somehow uh, politically uh, for the European Union. Um, and yeah, it's 80 billion uh, euros spent, and this money is, uh, or a lot of this money is spent also to private companies, and especially uh, companies like Thales, for example, um, which are like also like uh, involved in, in programs that I will talk about next. Um, yeah, so military companies, that means like a lot of this scientific money is uh, going into the development, uh, yeah, in military comp companies, and also a lot of this stuff can be used, uh, yeah, military afterwards. Um, the, the first thing I want to talk about is Ibotta control. What's it called? Like they're really awesome uh, with, with the names. Um, it's um, the, the idea about this, uh, or what it's for, is like a third country nationals. That means like I don't know people from, from the states or people from from India or, or, or wherever want to travel into the European Union. Uh, they they have to go through a process um, where, where they have to like yeah apply for the visa and, and then also like like get into like how, how they get in. And they are already like um, a risk analysis about how dangerous the person is um, has to start and this risk analysis will happen uh, in a web browser with webcam. So uh, the, the idea is uh, that you have to talk with an avatar, that's what they call them, uh, that's what they look like. 
Um, so, and this avatar will ask you questions, and in this webcam, your 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 uh, face uh, gets recognized, and and your your mimic gets analyzed, and they say like if you're dangerous or if you're not dangerous. Um, the Intercept had the chance to test the system. Um, I linked the um, article in the sources. It's, it's really worth reading. I think everybody who saw the talks about biometrical systems of Starbucks on this Congress knows how good those things are working, and they, yeah, they are working like as good as those avatars look. So, um, and um, what's then really interesting, like what's what's actually happening, like behind all the systems. And they, so they have a, have a, have a website, ibottercontrol.net, I guess, or org, or you can Google it. And uh, they, they, they give some internals, which is that. So, and um, I mean, you, you can get kind of an idea that you have the client side there and the, the, um, the portable unit that they have at the border checkpoints. But what is actually happening, like, in the middle of it? No, like, yeah, maybe like people can understand it, then I would be really interested in, in what's happening there. Um, what I'm like really interested in is like this database part in, in the middle, because like they, they start collecting data, weirdly biometrical data, obviously, and uh, we know what happens once an agency is collecting the stuff, other agencies also want to collect it. So like they, they, they're starting like building up all those databases, and like nobody's actually taking really care about what's happening with this data, and um, like in, in privacy concerns, like if it's legitimate to, to collect all this data of people who just want to travel into the European Union. For sure, like w when you think about like the first video that, that we show, like yeah, it's like all a flow of terrorists and yeah, for sure saving human lives. But yeah, um, it's, it's like the, the mindset they have that they want to collect all this data. And uh, what I think is really worth mentioning, um, like project partners, so uh, like the University uh, of Hannover is working also on the project. so. Yeah, and uh, the next program, Robota, it's like, they're like really good with those names. Um, it's like a fully functional um, autonomous border system. That, that means like they, I, I have actually no clue what it means because like if, if you want to have a full functional autonomous border system, it, it sounds like kind of Terminator for me. Like they, they talk about like drones in the air, in the water, on, on land, and they want to operate in swarms and they want to do it intelligently. And um, th that's what, what they want to make, like this, this picture of the Mediterranean Sea probably of, where they have this like all the time live surveillance, which they can document and play back as they want to, which, yeah, we have to see if it will work, but that's actually, uh, but that's at least what they plan. They start testing that now um, with um, at least one, like with, with, with multiple drones on, on COS and um, what's really interesting, they use like a mobile operation center, which is the MUROS, which maybe some of you will know, it's like the standard police surveillance uh, car in Berlin. So it's, it's like built by a German company and there they, that will be like the situation center where all this data goes together, which is like, if you, if you look at it technically, um, it's quite a hard task. And if you, if you see how they talk about it, like I'm, I'm really curious if this actually worked because like that's the, the actual really interesting question. If they say, or if they have the capabilities that they say they have, they watch live what's happening there, and they are able to, to see like live how people die there. And if it's not the case, they spend a lot of money on this cyber BS, um, where, where I actually like have like no clue like who's who's actually controlling it because like they, they have like now this this momentum where they say like yeah we're protecting the borders, there are terrorists coming like like this, and, and like yeah the, the migrant crisis and the wife of migrants is coming, give us money. And, and it, it's just like thrown to them. And that's like something we really, really, really have to talk about and what's happening with all the data they're collecting. Because like I said, we know like once data is collected, other people also want to have it. So what should be done? First of all, we have to stop forcing migrants to using these illegal routes, uh, these this irregular routes. Because as long as they have to take, take those boats, as long as there, there are like no legal ways to go into Europe, we have those irregular ways. That means people are forced to take those ways, and that means like, yeah, we, we, we're, we're enabling like to, 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 like in case that people want to get in, into Europe in an irregular way, we are like enabling it within like generating those big, big flows by not uh, enabling legal ways to enter Europe. Then, um, also in front of Frontex data needs to be more public, we have to have access to that, and researchers need to have access to that, and journalists, uh, journalists need, need to have access to that, so that we can actually talk about what's happening there, and that we know, and, and that we can actually save human lives with that. 
Um, what's also important, the uh, transparency in the decision process. So when they make this risk analysis, those risk analysis have like immense impact on, on, on human lives in the end. So we have no idea, uh, ideas how, how they are made. We have no ideas um, like what data they take and what data they don't take to make those risk analysis. And Frontex is trying to, to have like a console where, where also like NGOs can, can like work together with them and, and, and watch over that. Uh, see what's just applied for that and see what was declined to work with them. So, um, and what's really important, same privacy standards for everyone. So, and that's it for the part. So here are the sources. Thanks, guys, for a super interesting and important talk. We have uh, some time for questions. So if you have any questions from the crowd, uh, please line up uh, next to one of the three microphones in the aisle. Uh, questions from the internet, if we have, we'll take from the signal angel. Um, yes, any questions? If there's no question from the crowd, then I'll, ask, I'll start by asking a question. Um, the data that you guys are mentioning that should be open, um, is that anything that might fall under G GDPR in some way um, that maybe can assist in, in making that data more accessible? Or can Frontex somehow hide behind being like some sort of um, government body that maybe shouldn't or doesn't have to open that data out? Uh, so, so far, we, we didn't try to get, for example, like the AIS data um, from, from uh, via, yeah, um, free, um, right, like, like those. Uh, GDPR uh, requests. Um, the thing is, like, it's it's commercial data, so so that means this, they most likely get it from, from commercial service. So the, so the question is, like, th they have maybe like this this copyright thing again. What just happened is um, Fakten Start um, just sued Frontex um, for uh, position data of their vessels, which would be at least like also really interesting for us, like how close they are to to possible points, because we estimate or we guess that they're actually like quite closer to. Maybe you can also like talk about that they're like actually like yeah, way closer to two points than they, than they actually say so and they're also like the cause that no they don't have to so see. microphone number two yeah sort of as a follow-up to this like is there enough public information or almost public information like uh, ADSB from the aircraft and AIS from the ships to watch what Frontex is doing and have that guide uh, your search missions as well because they might be on top of what's happening and standing by doing nothing. And it might be the interesting spots for you to find out. Although, I don't know, do they turn off their AIS and their ADSB transponders uh, to hide where they are? Or? Yeah, they do. Um, <coughs> I mean, that's the short answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's a bit of a weird situation. We um, fly from Lampedusa and uh, Frontex flies from there as well. So we often stand next to our aircraft in the morning and we land afterwards and um, yeah. And then they talk to us and um, in some of these conversations they've even admitted to doing that. Um, and the only way of us, I mean, sometimes you, you get some data from them, sometimes they don't switch it off, sometimes you can also see uh, military assets from Operation Sophia that are um, down there, but most of the times um, it's switched off and sometimes they appear in the area list, but we don't get actual tracks. And um, yeah, for the ships, it's basically the same. And apart from that, um, the European Union has withdrawn all their ships because uh, with ships, they have to save lives. Um, that that's, doesn't fit with what they really want to do, so um, they have chosen to only operate aircraft at the moment um, so that they can then give all this data that they collect to the so-called Libyan Coast Guard and they operate the ships that are obviously donated by the EU. And then um, the Libyans uh, fortunately have not signed the Geneva Convention that would prevent them from bringing people back to Libya, which obviously the EU countries have. So it's, yeah, it's working out quite well for the EU to uh, only ha have aircraft that um, gather all this data and then um, give it to the Libyans so they can bring the people back to hell. And we don't have any insight really into it, apart from being there and seeing them um, do this. But, yeah. Microphone number one. Hey, um, thanks a lot for a very interesting talk. Um, I was just thinking and wondering, um, this surveillance system, if or when it's implemented, could that actually backfire? 
because as far as I know, it's highly illegal to um, ignore mayday calls, to not help for any vessel that's within range. So if there's like a 24 seven monitoring of the entire Mediterranean Sea, every time a vessel sinks, uh, this is being watched somehow automatically or manually. And so every time there's um, a case for taking people to court. Uh, yeah, I, uh, we think that's actually ha happening already at the moment, that they have in their archives quite some stuff which might be quite problematic for them. And if it finds the way somehow to the public, we would be like super happy about that. Um, but um, yeah, like it, it could absolutely backfire. And that's also why we really want like transparency in this data and, and want this data to be, to be shared publicly because um, it, it could also be used as a control for them to monitor them. Um, I mean, w w it's like this. It's like this whole privacy debate. Like I, I think it's still quite a creepy system. Um, but yeah, it, it, for for gathering evidence on what they do, it might be super interesting. Yeah. Any more question from the internet? Has a question? Yes. Yes, the internet asks: um, uh, When human rights violations are being monitored or proofed, um, aren't there any procedures of EU law enforcement to take consequences on that crimes in case of watching but not supporting? Mm, it's a bit tricky. Um, so for us, um, as civilians, um, we can't uh, take the states, if, if um, they're, in this case, breaking the law, um, or the Libyans to court. Uh, we don't have that right. States could do that. Um, obviously, they don't have any interest in doing so. Um, it, de it depends a bit. So usually, the only people that could actually sue are the people that are affected, so the people on the boats, um, or if uh, people have died, then their relatives could also sue them. But most of the times, um, these people are not actually anywhere um, in Europe, for example, where they have access to um, a whole jurisdictional system. Um, so that's the, the one problem with some cases um, with state actors involved, um, prosecutors in the respective state could, uh, could sue them. Um, and this is mainly interesting in the case of Italy, because Italy has um, marine ships down there um, from, from, the, um, from the Navy, and um, there are still some forces in Italy, I'd say, uh, who are investigating into this direction, and um, uh, whom we're also in touch with, and giving, giving our data, um, so that potentially at least with the like, Italian Navy, um, there, there could be some effect. But um, yeah, for now, all we can do is either yeah, publicize this and make it um, yeah, Europe-wide known uh, that this is happening, um, so that yeah, potentially something develops out of that, but we can't take them to court ourselves. So one last question for microphone number two. Maybe also one addition to that. Uh, what was also really important when you, when you look at those systems, um, that's like really hard sometimes to, to get a re responsibility, like uh, one responsible person in, in this whole. Uh, for example, when you take a risk analysis, which might lead to, to more intense border controls, which make it more impossible for, uh, for people to get into country A or B. Um, this, is, this is like a really abstract process um, where, where like a lot of, of people take decisions which lead up into this decision, which make make it impossible for people to enter Europe. Um, but yeah, you, you don't have like this one person which is, which is responsible for that, which also those really complex systems enable. So. so last question for microphone number two, please make it short. So thanks for the talk and for the, the great work you're doing. Um, pivoting off the question about AIS and other using their data to, to profile them, are you looking at things like within the realms of the legal, of course, looking at their drone downlinks, metadata that they're leaking through sites that they're using and things like that to sort of get a sense of, of what they're seeing or what data they're leaking that they're not aware of? Um, not so far, except for radio calls that, that we, we office or like the, the, the urban people uh, definitely hear. Um, but we are like highly interested in everybody who can help us in doing that. So. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, I want to, again, uh, thank you very much for the work that you're doing. It's amazing. And thanks for the great talk.